At this point, I wanted to tell you about a different kind of theory for the transition between the isotropic phase and the nomadic phase in liquid crystals. Um, so uh, this is more of a um, molecular style theory, um, which was uh, developed by uh, Meyer and Zalpa. And let's see what's happened to my iPad here. Uh, okay, so uh, Zalpa, by the way, uh, he was um, originally German. He spent a lot of his career as a professor at LCI uh, and then retired back to, to Germany um, when, uh, when I, moved here uh, in 2005, I got his office. And so I was lucky that way, not that I use the office much this year. Um, so um, in, in this style of theory, right, we, we want to go back to something kind of like how we began with the Eisen model, that we imagine now that there are lots of molecules and each pair of molecules has some interaction. So that's what's meant to be drawn. This is my little cartoon of uh, a whole bunch of molecules. Right? And um, each of these has some orientation, which is represented by a unit vector. All right, so now let's concentrate on this pair of molecules over there. Okay. So this pair um, has uh, orientations given by the unit vectors uh, L and M, which have a, uh, an angle of gamma in between those unit vectors, a relative orientation of gamma. So um, Meyer-Zalpa theory um, begins with an assumption for the intermolecular interaction, right, for how that depends on the relative orientation. Okay, we can say, let's um, assume that the um, interaction uh, potential energy is uh, some uh, negative constant times this P2 of the cosine of this relative angle, or in other words, that it's negative j times three halves cosine squared gamma minus a half, right? So this P2 is the uh, Legendre polynomial that we were talking about earlier. Um, so um, this is an interaction which is um, most negative if, um, if gamma equals either zero or pi, right? And so if gamma equals zero, then this uh, cosine is equal to one. And so then inside the brackets, we have three halves minus one half, that's one, okay? So the potential is a nice negative J. It's just the same thing if gamma equals pi, right? So that if the two vectors were aligned this way and this way, it's exactly the same, okay? But if the vectors are perpendicular to each other. So the gamma is pi over two, then the cosine is zero. And you get an interaction potential, which is, um, uh, it's a negative number inside the brackets multiplied by the minus sign out in front. So it's a positive number. That's an unfavorable interaction, okay? So we could say that this interaction favors um, parallel or anti-parallel alignment. And it uh, disfavors uh, perpendicular alignment. So, why should we believe that the interaction potential has this form, 
right? Well, I, I can um, think of two reasons to, to believe this, right? So one kind of justification is um, if we think about uh, fluctuating dipole moments. This is something that came up in one of our classes uh, a few days ago. Um, that is, if we think um, there are electrons that are moving around on these atoms, or on these molecules, excuse me, uh, then at any moment in time, there might be a fluctuation where you have more positive charges over here and negative charges over there. And that fluctuation will tend to induce other fluctuations on the neighboring molecules. And then the temporary dipole moments will interact with each other. And this interaction will be bigger if the molecules are parallel or anti-parallel so that electrons can move around a lot in similar directions. This interaction will be not so big if the molecules are approximately perpendicular to each other. There's not as much room for the electrons to move around, and so it's harder to develop a large dipole moment. So this is a kind of um, anisotropic uh, van der Waals interaction. So that's, that's one kind of justification for uh, this sort of interaction potential. Um, a second um, kind of justification would be uh, whatever the orientation dependence of the interaction potential might be, it can be expanded in a series of, uh, of Legendre polynomials. Um, it's like in two dimensions, anything that depends on the single angle can be expanded in a Fourier series, right? So here, the generalization for angles in three dimensions is you could expand anything in a series of, well, spherical harmonics. And this is the, uh, the second order. This is the leading term in an expansion. So- Excuse me. Uh, I guess they are assuming uh, there is an um, azimuthal symmetry um, for, for this interaction, right? Yes, it, exactly. So it's assuming an azimuthal symmetry of the interaction, which comes to assuming that um, the, uh, the molecules are cylindrically symmetric, right? That they have only one special axis, right? Whereas if they had two special axes like this, like my hands here, then there would be something else in the interaction which would maybe favor this kind of alignment, right? The, the palm to palm alignment rather than this sort, right? Then it would be more complicated. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so you can, you can um, think about either of these justifications. Okay, but let's let's go with it. Okay, so let's suppose that this assumption is correct. What can we do with it? Okay, well, what we want to do with it then is the same kind of thing that we did with the Ising model and with the interacting gas. That is, we want to um, calculate the the free energy. Okay, so if we want the the free energy. So that's going to be the expectation value of the energy minus temperature times the entropy. Okay. Now, when I write the letter S for entropy, I have to think, oh no, look, we have the letter S that means two different things, right? The letter S is the letter for entropy. And the letter S is also the letter for the pneumatic order parameter. Those are two completely different concepts, right? So maybe I better just write out entropy here. 
this is the S that's entropy as opposed to the S that's the pneumatic order parameter. Okay, those don't get those S's mixed up. They're different S's. Um, okay, so what can we say about the expectation value of the energy? So the expectation value of the energy, um, that's going to be, um, well, the expectation value of this thing that I showed you, the three halves, cosine squared gamma minus a half times an overall coefficient of uh, the strength of the potential, J, um, that was right, uh, right here. And then there's something about you know, how many interacting pairs of molecules are there uh, inside the, the liquid crystal, right? Well, let's say there are N molecules and each molecule interacts with Q neighbors, right? Each molecule is surrounded by ooh, eight or 10 neighbors and it interacts with those guys. Um, and then N times Q, this would be double counting the number of interacting pairs. So I better divide by two to compensate for that. Okay. Now, if we want to estimate this quantity, so minus JNQ over two, okay, this is three halves, the cosine squared of the angle, well, the cosine of the angle is the dot product of the two unit vectors, right? So this is three halves L dot m quantity squared minus a half. Can we simplify that? Right, well, minus j n q over two. Um, we want, uh, let's, let's write this in a tensor notation, okay? So um, l dot m, this would be like in L I M I. Okay. Now it's squared. So I'll write L dot M again. L J M J. Like this. Minus a half. Excuse me. Are you assuming this interaction is a long range interaction? No, it only reaches out to Q neighbors, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it's not an interaction with every other molecule in the material, right? I mean, if, if I wanted to um, be more detailed, right? I could make a model for how does the interaction depend on distance and then have it um, you know, as a function of distance and then compare with the number of molecules, the density of molecules within that distance. Uh, I'm trying to keep things relatively simple here, um, just to say it goes out to Q neighbors with equal strength and then it's zero. But even that, even that kind of simplification, this is still too complicated to solve exactly, right? So here, this is an expectation value that has to do with the orientation of neighboring molecules, right? It, it has to do with uh, how um, molecule L is interacting with molecule uh, M, right? And so these are um, two different molecules um, and you know, it's already beyond our ability to do exact calculations, right? To figure out these correlations, right? And it's very similar to how when we had the Ising model, we uh, at some point worked out an expectation value of the energy, 
which involved the product of sigma on site one with sigma on site number two, right? Even that was something that we were unable to solve exactly. But we could solve it approximately in the Isaac model, right? When we were dealing with something like this, we made the um, mean field approximation that this uh, expectation value of the product would be approximately the product of the expectation values. All right, you remember that stage of approximation when we were working on the Isaac model. And then each of these things is just the Ising order parameter M so that the mean field approximation gave us a, an energy which was proportional to m squared. The same thing works here. Okay. Here, the idea in the um, mean field approximation is that we can approximate this product of things that are going on at different molecules by LILJ, you know, what's happening for molecule L and MIMJ, what's happening for molecule J. Okay. And then each of these things is related to the Q tensor. All right, that each of those things is, oh, it's approximately the same thing as the Q tensor, except for this annoying factors of three halves and stuff like that, right? So in particular, this is equal to um, two thirds QIJ plus one third delta IJ. And so is this. Um, okay, so now we can use tensor algebra to simplify this kind of expression, okay? So um, we can um, work out all of this stuff and then we have to multiply by three halves and then subtract one half. Um, in this class, I'm going to skip over a lot of steps because otherwise the calculation just takes too long. So all of the steps are written out explicitly in, uh, in the text in uh, section uh, 10.4. So please take a look there, okay? So I'm gonna skip over the steps and I will tell you that all of this stuff, when you do the simplifications, um, it reduces to um, negative one third J and Q uh, times QIJ, QIJ, just like that. It is a Q squared kind of interaction the same way that the Ising thing was an M squared kind of interaction. And then if we reduce that to what's happening with the scalar order parameter and the director, all right, this is about uh, negative a half J and Q times S squared. So, um, the same way that the Ising interaction, there's an energy that favors the largest possible value of the magnetic order parameter. Here, there's an interaction that favors the largest possible value of the pneumatic order parameter. All right, so um, this interaction, it, favors S equals one 
right? The energy favors perfect nomadic order, right? That will give the most negative possible energy. So that then is the energy part of the free energy. But that has to fight against the entropy part of the free energy. Okay, so now we better estimate that thing. Okay. So um, again, we can do it by analogy with the Ising model. Okay. So for the Ising model, uh, we know we have um, probabilities that the spin could be pointing up or down. Okay, so that has probabilities P up and P down. And there is a normalization. That is that the probabilities have to add up to one. Once we have that, then we can calculate the entropy, okay? And what we find is that the entropy times negative T is equal to this number of molecules times KT, and then the P up log P up plus P down log P down. So this sum of P log P, this is an, um, uh, a kind of expression that comes up in information theory for the Shannon entropy, for example. But it's the general entropy whenever you have a distribution function. Right? And the distribution function um, you know, has multiple possibilities. Well, in this case, it's just two possibilities. And so here we're summing P log P over both of the possibilities. In, um, if there were three possibilities, we'd be adding up P log P over all three, right? What about for the, the liquid crystal now? For a liquid crystal, there aren't two possible orientations or three, but the molecules could be pointing in any direction in three dimensional space. So there's a whole probability distribution function. That is, we could say, what's the probability of having the molecules with any orientations, theta and phi, right? Where those are the standard coordinates in um, spherical coordinates, okay? So a probability distribution function, rho of theta and phi. And it has to be normalized, right? That is to say that the total probability has to add up to one. But here, because it's continuous, we're not just adding up two possibilities, but we have to integrate over all the possible angles. Right? So we better do an integral in spherical coordinates. Okay? What you can remember from a multivariable calculus class is the way you integrate in spherical coordinates is you have to integrate sine theta d theta from zero to pi and integrate d phi from zero to two pi, All right? This is an integral in spherical coordinates of rho of theta and phi, and that has to equal one. This is how we express the constraint of normalization 
Yeah, which is the continuous version of that thing. Is that clear to you guys? Any questions about doing that sort of interval? It's okay. All right. Then we can figure out the entropy in the same style. Okay. So then we could say that the um, entropy, the entropy is going to be um, negative t times this entropy is the number of molecules times kt and then an integral sine theta d theta an integral 0 to 2 pi d phi of rho of theta and phi times the log of rho of theta and phi. Okay. So um, this is the continuous generalization of that okay, to this whole set of orientations. Okay, so now let's let's put the pieces together to see what do we have so far? Okay. So, so far we have um, a free energy, which is this um, negative a half um, J N Q times the nomadic order parameter squared. All right. So the energy, that looks pretty simple. Okay. And then there's this entropy term of uh, plus n kt, this integral sine theta d theta integral d phi of uh, rho of theta n phi log rho of theta n phi. Okay, now you um, might look at this and say, well, this is kind of weird because the first term is expressed in terms of this pneumatic order parameter. The second term is expressed in terms of this distribution function. If we want to close the loop, right, we have to connect. How is the pneumatic order parameter related to the distribution function? Right. Well, it's, it's an average, right? That the pneumatic order parameter is the average of P2 of cosine theta. So we can calculate an average using a distribution function. We do it by saying we have to sum up over all the possibilities. That's an integral, sine theta d theta, integral d phi. Of the thing that we want to average, P2 of cosine theta, times the probability of having that value. So rho of theta and phi. So this is the pneumatic order parameter. This thing goes into here and it gets squared, okay? And then we have a free energy where everything depends on the distribution function. So um, the free energy depends on the function rho of theta and phi. On the, on the distribution function. So, 
So then the question is, what function rho of theta n phi gives the minimum f? This is something that you can recognize as a variational calculus problem, right? It's, it's like the other variational calculus things where we say, you know, what, uh, uh, what path for the bobsled gives the shortest uh, uh, travel time, okay? So here we have a, 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 a function that we want to minimize, right? We want to minimize f, which is this set of integrals. Okay. We minimize it over all possible distribution functions, which satisfy the normalization constraint. Okay. So we can do that using the, vari the variational calculus technique that I showed you. Unfortunately, there's just a lot of algebra to do that. And um, I've tried doing it in front of students. They tend to fall asleep. Um, and so um, instead of me doing that now, I want to direct you to the uh, section 10.4 in the book where all that is worked out, okay? And instead, I will uh, skip to the answer. The answer is that we must have the row of theta and phi is um, an exponential of some um, effective potential energy divided by kt, divided by a normalization. That is- It's a version of Euler-Lagrange equation, or yes. this is just- Yes, this is the solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay, thank you. A, a solution uh, of the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, subject to the constraint of normalization. Uh, so we have to put that in using a Lagrange multiplier. So this is the, the solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation is this thing, okay, where this V effective is some parameter negative U kt uh, times p2 uh, cosine theta, okay? That is, all solutions can be written like this, where u is a strength of the effective potential that um, aligns molecules uh, along the director. Okay. This strength is related to the pneumatic order parameter S. It is related to the pneumatic order parameter in the sense that u equals zero implies s equals zero. But it's not the same thing because if u goes to infinity, that is if there's a super strong effective potential, then the pneumatic order parameter is one. So the dependence of S on U 
is a function sort of like this that's asymptotic, right? That as u goes from zero to infinity, s goes from zero to one. Okay, so then that means that instead of minimizing f as a function of all possible distribution functions, the problem reduces to calculating just f as a function of u. Um, and then we want to um, minimize that Um, and then find the optimal u, and then find the optimal s. So that's a sketch of how the calculation looks. Let's switch to Mathematica now and I'll, I'll show you graphs to show you how it all works out. So I will stop iPad and share Mathematica. Okay, and as usual, I will post the Mathematica up on uh, Blackboard. Okay, so um, here, this first line is um, a calculation for how are u and s related to each other? And this is shown um, in the plot right here, okay? And so u and s you know, basically involve the same kind of information, but u goes from zero to infinity and s goes from zero to one. Okay? So in this theory, the maximum value of s is really one. That's good. I mean, maximum value of s really is one. Okay. Then um, I, I go through here to find the Myers alpha free energy divided by kT in terms of, well, there's a negative something times s squared. This is the energy part. Then there's all this stuff. This is the entropy part. Okay. And um, please do read about how to calculate this. Read this on your own and then um, we can talk about any questions that you might have. But in any case, yeah, it comes out to be a function of u it's kind of a messy function of u, but it's a function of u, so we can plot it. So here's one of my nice plots with a, with a slider. I can change the temperature and see what the plot looks like. So at high temperature, the plot looks like this. As I reduce the temperature, you can see what happens, right? First, there's a minimum only at u equals zero. That's the isotropic phase. As I reduce the temperature, we start to get another minimum. We start to get a metastable minimum over here. That's the pneumatic, a metastable pneumatic phase. As we continue to reduce the temperature, at some point, the two free energies become just equal to each other. That's the temperature for the isotropic to pneumatic transition. And then if we continue to reduce the temperature, the pneumatic minimum becomes even lower than the isotropic minimum. The system is in the pneumatic phase. And if we continue to reduce the temperature, the minimum shifts to larger and larger values of U. 
the same series of plots occurs also if I plot it in terms of uh, f versus s rather than f versus u. Okay. That is, at high temperature, there's only one minimum, which is at s equals zero. If I reduce the temperature, then we eventually develop a second minimum over here. That is at uh, S uh, equals about 0.4. Right. And now it's a metastable minimum. If we continue to reduce the temperature, we can see that uh, at some point we reach the isotropic pneumatic transition. That is, where the two minima are equally deep. Then if we continue to reduce the temperature, whoops, reduce, 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 okay. Then the pneumatic minimum becomes deeper. Okay? And then this is going to be the only minimum, right? This is, this is the, by far the deepest and it is moving out to larger and larger values of S. Based on this, I can make a plot for what happens for S as a function of temperature, or what happens to you as a function of temperature. Uh, let me skip to the plot of S here, okay? We can see that at high temperature, the, um, the pneumatic order parameter is zero. And then at a certain temperature, there's a discontinuity. It's a jump from S equals zero up to S equals about 0 0.4, 0 0.41, something like that. And then if we continue to reduce the temperature, uh, S increases from there, right? And when we approach uh, very low temperatures, approach zero Kelvin, then um, S approaches one. Okay. So this is an alternative theoretical approach, right? Which is based on the, the mean field theory for a particular model of the interaction. Um, and you can see that the result is actually remarkably similar to what I showed you from the landau degen theory in the, in the previous class, right? Um, in the landau degen theory, just based on symmetry considerations, I, I could make up what are the possible forms for the free energy as a function of the pneumatic order parameter. And actually they were pretty much like this, right? It was a function of the free energy functions, which had this series of shapes as we change the parameter A. And we had a speculation that the parameter A is related to temperature. And here, yeah, it actually it works with this specific model as we vary the temperature, we really do go through this series of forms for the free energy. Okay, so now let me go back to the iPad and let me summarize uh, what we've learned from, from doing this. Okay, so um, let's see, stop the Mathematica, share iPad. Uh, oops, is it going to work? Yes, good. Okay. What have we learned? Okay, so um, the one, one general point is that there is a um, first order transition from isotropic to pneumatic. 
that is, there is a discontinuity in the nomadic order parameter S. This part is um, consistent with, um, with the Landau de Gen theory that we already had. Okay. But now we get um, a few more um, specific points. One more specific point is um, what is the transition temperature? Okay, and so um, there is a, a um, prediction here that the transition temperature is at TIN is um, you know, a point two two uh, times uh, JQ over Boltzmann's constant. Okay. Now, is this a useful prediction or not, right? Well, I don't know. It's a little bit useful in the sense that um, J is a measure of the strength of the interaction between molecules. And Q is a measure of the number of molecules that any particular molecule interacts with. And so um, this tells us that the transition temperature is um, proportional to the strength of the anisotropic interaction. So this is maybe slightly more useful than what was happening in the landau de Gen theory, where we say, oh, the transition temperature is a T0 plus something, and we don't have any idea what T0 is, right? So here, we can at least say, well, it's proportional to the strength of the anisotropic interaction. That's something, but it's still not telling us a transition temperature for a particular compound like 5CB. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to get that from such a general theory. For that, we will either need to um, do a more molecular modeling with you know, software that models uh, specific chemical structures, or to just do the experiment and measure what it is for a particular compound. Um, another thing that we get from this is the um, magnitude of nomadic order um, just below the transition, T-I-N. That is to say that the transition is, um, is a transition from S equals zero to S something not equal to zero. And Meyer's alpha theory is making a specific prediction for how much order there is on the nomadic side of the transition. It predicts that S is, uh, is about 0.4. And actually in my notes, I see it is 0.429. Uh, so this is a specific numerical prediction that people can compare with experiments. And um, so, you know, in experiments, people can measure it, and it's, you know, it's not bad, this prediction. It's not exactly right. Experiments are somewhat higher than this um, because the intermolecular interaction is not exactly the interaction that's being assumed here. Okay? But this is saying, you know, on a scale of zero to one, the nomadic phase right below TIN um, is, you know, it's, it's 0.429 or ordered, right? So part way, but not completely ordered. Right? That's a meaningful prediction. 
Um, and we can see that um, uh, if we reduce the temperature, so as T goes to zero Kelvin, then S goes to one. Right, so S has a maximum saturated value, um, which is um, uh, physically realistic, right? Unlike the landau degen theory, which doesn't know about the maximum possible order parameter. Um, okay, so these are the, the highlights of Meyer-Zalpa theory. Um, which I have now, you know, compactified into one hour. Um, but the, the calculation, you know, I skipped over a lot of steps. And so please do um, take a look at that section 10.4 so that you can see, you know, how you would do those steps. Um, but, you know, these points that I've summarized here, right, these are the main things to keep in mind along with the shapes of the graphs, right? So we have the shapes of the graphs for the free energy, right? The graphs which look like free energy as a function of S and, you know, they look like this and then like this and then like that and then like that, right? So um, you have this sequence of graph shapes which is just like what we expected based on symmetry in the landau degen theory, symmetry is right, okay? And then um, this set of predictions, um, graphs for the free energy, gives rise to a graph for S as a function of T, which looks like uh, the zero down to the transition temperature, and then it jumps to the 0.429, and then it increases you know, on the way to one. Um, so those are, I would say, the, the main points to get out of Meyer-Zalpa theory. Um, in the next class, I'm going to, uh, present uh, just very briefly a, a different style of theory, um, Anzager theory, um, which applies uh, especially to uh, lyotropic liquid crystals, that is to uh, particles, rod-like particles that are suspended in water or another solvent. Um, and then um, after that, we'll move on to uh, different subjects related to the, the direction of liquid crystal order. Uh, okay, I will stop for here and I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, either about this subject or about the homework or anything else that you have questions about. All right, thanks. Could you please go back to the page where you talked about, uh, you derived the energy of the, um, of this liquid crystal system. Mm -hmm. um, the, the potential yeah. energy, right, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. So it seems that when S is zero, then the potential energy is zero, right? When S is negative half, then the potential energy is even lower than the potential energy of isotropic phase, right? So does this mean um, the potential energy favors um, negative scalar order parameter rather than uh, isotropic phase? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, because um, even in this negative pneumatic phase, um, the molecules are, are more likely to be parallel to each other than they are in an isotropic phase, right? And you know, in an isotropic phase, 
they could be pointing in any direction in three-dimensional space. In the negative pneumatic phase, they, they tend to be aligned in a plane and they can be pointing anywhere in the plane. So they still could be parallel or perpendicular to each other, but statistically, they're more likely to be parallel if they're confined to a plane than if they could point anywhere in three-dimensional space, right? So from the point of view uh, of, of this model, right, um, um, negative pneumatic is better than isotropic, right? But positive pneumatic is even better than negative pneumatic because positive pneumatic can go up to S equals one, right? Where negative pneumatic can only go to S equals negative a half. So positive perfect pneumatic would be, um, you know, four times better than um, ne perfect negative pneumatic. Okay. Can this uh, measure salt theory given equilibrium state with negative uh, scalar order parameter, like uh, we got in the land of the jump theory? No, it, it does not, right? Um, and so uh, it, uh, it, it only has the, the transition that I showed you, you know, in, well, the free energy plot that I showed you in Mathematica. Uh, and so um, the minima, are either at s equals zero or s positive. Um, so you might say, you know, um, if you do um, a power series expansion of the Myers alpha free energy, right, you could get the a, b, and c coefficients, right? And the b is always negative. In, uh, right, the b is always negative. Okay. Um, uh, right. So um, this Myers Alpha theory uh, does not predict a negative pneumatic phase in equilibrium. Now, there are a lot of modifications that people have made over the years. And, um, and it maybe there's been some kind of modification that can give a negative pneumatic with some extra assumptions, you know, modifying the interaction in some way. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, this is, this is classical theoretical work that goes back many decades. And you know, there've been a lot of different um, versions of it over the years since then. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh-huh, great, great.